In this video, I'll be going through the 2021 May June IGCSE Physics Theory Core Paper. Figure 1.1 shows a speed time graph for a car. Describe the motion of the car from 0 to 50 seconds as shown in Figure 1.1. From our 0 to 50 seconds, we see that the speed is constant over time, therefore, we have a constant speed. Describe the motion of the car from 50 seconds to 90 seconds as shown in figure 1.1. From our 50 seconds to our 90 seconds, we see the speed reduced to zero. The speed decreases to zero. Furthermore, we see that this is constant deceleration because our slope and therefore our acceleration is constant over this time. Calculate the distance traveled by the car between 50 seconds and 90 seconds. The distance travelled is going to be the area underneath our graph. The area of our area here is going to be base times height, but we see we have a triangle, so it's going to be half base times height. Where our base is our 40 seconds, and our height is our 6 metres per second. Which gives me 120 metres. A motorcycle travels at a constant speed. The motorcycle travels 710 meters in 87 seconds. Calculate the speed of the motorcycle and show that it is close to 8 meters per second. Speed is equal to distance over time. Our distance is 17 and our time is 87 seconds, which gives me 8.16 meters per second, which is close to 8 meters per second. The motorcycle in part BI travels at a constant speed for 87 seconds. On figure 1.1, draw the speed time graph for the motorcycle. So we have a speed of 8 meters per second for 87 seconds, which means our line is going to stay at 8 meters per second and is going to end at 87 seconds, which is roughly here. A liquid in glass thermometer contains mercury. The mass of the mercury in the thermometer is 12 grams. Calculate the weight of the mercury. Our weight force is equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration, where our mass is 12 grams, or 0.012 kilograms. And our acceleration due to gravity is 10, which gives me 0.12 newtons. The 12 grams of mercury has a volume of 0.88 centimeter cube. Calculate the density of mercury. The equation for density is mass per volume. The question is wanting an answer in grams per centimeter cube, so we'll leave our mass as 12 grams, which gives me 13.6 grams per centimeter cube, or 14 to two significant figures. The mercury in the thermometer expands when its temperature rises. State what happens to the mass of the mercury when its temperature rises. The mass stays the same because there's no reason it wouldn't. State what happens to the density of the mercury when its temperature rises. Recalling that our density is our mass per volume, our mass stays the same, but if the temperature rises, our volume is going to increase. If our volume increases, then our density is going to decrease. A plank balances horizontally on a log of wood, which acts as a pivot. A girl sits on one end of the plank, and her brother pushes down on the other end to make the plank balance horizontally. Figure 3.1 shows the arrangement. Calculate the moment of the girl's weight about the pivot and show that it is close to 480 newton meters. The moment of the girl is equal to her weight force multiplied by her distance from the pivot. Her weight is 404, and her distance is 1.2 which gives me 480 newton meters, which is what we're trying to find. The plank balances horizontally when the boy pushes down with a force F at a distance of 1.6 meters from the pivot. Calculate the size of the force. Because the plank is balancing, we know that the moment of the boy must equal the moment of the girl. The moment of the boy is his force times his distance of 1.6, and the moment of the girl is what we found earlier, our 480. Solving this for force by dividing both sides by 1.6 gives me 300 newtons. A country needs to build new power stations to provide electricity for homes and industry. One type of power station is a coal-fired power station. Describe how the energy stored in the coal is used in a coal-fired power station to generate electrical energy. Let's break this down step by step. 
The coal is burned to produce heat, the heat is used to boil water to steam, the steam is used to drive a turbine, and the turbine drives an electric generator. Some people in the country argue against building a new coal-fired power station. They say that the power station is expensive and not very efficient. Explain the meaning of not very efficient. What this means is that a large amount of the energy from burning the coal is lost as waste energy. Apart from cost and efficiency, give two other reasons for not building a coal-fired power station. And there are many reasons to choose from. Possibly the most obvious is the release of greenhouse gases driving climate change, and also that it's non-renewable. A man starts pulling his suitcase across the floor. Figure 5.1 shows the horizontal forces acting on the suitcase. Calculate the resultant horizontal force on the suitcase. Our resultant force is the difference between the forces, which is our 20 newtons minus 12 newtons, which gives us 8 newtons. And because our forward's force is larger, our direction is going to be forwards. After a short time, the suitcase is moving at a constant speed. Suggest values for the sizes of the two horizontal forces on the suitcase when it is moving at a constant speed. All that really matters here is that these forces are the same. The total downwards force of the suitcase on the ground is 150 newtons. The suitcase has two wheels. Each wheel has an area of 0.6 cm square touching the ground. Calculate the pressure of the suitcase on the ground. Pressure is force divided by area. Our force is 150. And because we have two wheels, our area is going to be 2 times 0.6, which gives me 125 newtons per cm square. Figure 6.1 shows a smoke cell. The smoke cell contains air molecules and smoke particles. A student views the motion of the smoke particles in the smoke cell by using a microscope. Figure 6.2 shows the path of one of the smoke particles. State the term used for the motion of the smoke particle, which is of course Brownian motion. Explain the motion of the smoke particle. Air molecules collide randomly with smoke particles, causing random changes in their motion. A narrow beam of white light enters a glass prism and splits into the colours of the visible spectrum, as shown in figure 7.1. The rays leaving the prism represent the seven main colours of the visible spectrum. Complete the labelling on figure 7.1 by writing the colours of the visible spectrum in the table. The effect we see here is refraction, where higher wavelengths are refracted more than lower. A useful way to remember this is that violet refracts more violently. So we're going to expect violet here and red here. The seven main colours of the visible spectrum can be remembered with the phrase Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. State the term used to describe the bending of light as it enters the prism, that is refraction, and the different amounts of bending that produce the spectrum, which is dispersion. A student incorrectly writes some sentences about electromagnetic waves. His teacher circles a mistake in each sentence. In the table, write a suitable correction for each mistake. The first one has been done for you. X-rays are used in television remote controllers, when in fact, that is infrared. Radio waves have the highest frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, when in fact radio waves have the lowest, it is gamma rays that have the highest. A loudspeaker is producing a sound. Choose words from the box to complete the sentences about sound. To increase the loudness of the sound, increase the blank of the sound wave. Loudness is described by amplitude. To increase the pitch of the sound, increase the blank of the sound wave. Pitch is described by the frequency. Two students determine the speed of sound in air. The students stand together 80 meters from a large brick wall as shown in figure 8.1. One student shouts, and as he shouts, the other student starts a stopwatch. She stops the stopwatch when she hears the echo of the shout. The reading on the stopwatch is 0.56 seconds. State the total distance the sound wave travels during the 0.56 seconds. Our sound wave has to go to the brick wall, and then return. The total distance is therefore going to be 2 times our 80, which is 160. Calculate the speed of sound in air using the measurements given in part B. Our velocity is distance divided by time, where our distance is 160, and our time is 0.56, which gives me 286.7 meters per second, or to two significant figures, 290. 
The student's value for the speed of sound is not accurate. Suggest two ways of improving the student's experiment. There are a few ways that the students could do this. First of all, they could stand further from the wall, which would reduce their error from their reaction time in proportion to their measurements. Secondly, they could repeat and average. The box lists four materials. Use words from the box to answer parts I and II. Each word may be used once, more than once, or not at all. State all materials that are electrical insulators. Aluminum isn't, iron isn't, and plastic and wood are. State one example of a magnetic material. Of the four, only iron is magnetic. Figure 9.1 shows two magnets P and Q which are repelling each other. On magnet P, the north pole is labelled N. On figure 9.1, label the other pole on magnet P and both poles on magnet Q. If our north pole is here, then we must have a south pole here. For repulsion to be occurring, we must have a south pole here, because likes repel. If we have a south pole here, then we must have a north pole here. One advantage that electromagnets have compared with permanent magnets is that their strength can easily be altered. State one other advantage of an electromagnet compared with a permanent magnet. Unlike permanent magnets, electromagnets can be switched off. A student wants to make the strongest electromagnet possible, indicate which properties produce the strongest electromagnet. For the number of turns in the coil, the more the merrier. For the material in the core, the best material is iron, because you want something that is magnetic. And for the size of the current in the coil, once again, the more the merrier, which is at 3 amps. They've tried to be sneaky with our 20 here, but of course that is milliamps. Figure 10.1 shows a lamp and a resistor connected in a circuit. Determine the combined resistance of the 3 ohm resistor and the 5 ohm lamp. Because they are in series, their resistances add together, giving us 8 ohms. The reading on ammeter X is 0.5 amps. State the reading on ammeter Y. Because this is a series circuit, the current is the same at all points. So our reading on ammeter Y is the same as ammeter X, 0.5 amps. In another circuit, the 3 ohm resistor and the 5 ohm lamp are connected in parallel, as shown in figure 10.2. The lamp and resistor have changed from a series to a parallel combination. State and explain the effect of this change on the current in ammeter X. When you add resistors in series, you increase the resistance, which leads to a reduction in the current. Whereas when you add a resistor in parallel, the resistance decreases. Because what's important is not that you've added a resistance, it is that you've added another pathway. No matter how bad that pathway, it still allows more current to flow. So let's write that. Adding the lamp reduces the circuit resistance below its initial value of 3 ohms. As a result, the current increases and the reading on ammeter X will be greater. The current in a different lamp is 0.4 amps when the potential difference across the lamp is 6 volts. Calculate the resistance of the lamp. Ohm's law states that V equals IR. To solve for resistance, we divide both sides by our current. Our voltage is 6 and our current is 0.4, which gives me 15 ohms. A student uses a coil and a magnet on a spring to generate an electromagnetic force that varies. He suspends the magnet above the coil as shown in figure 11.1. .1. The student pulls the magnet through the coil to X and then releases it. The magnet moves up and down through the coil. State the type of voltage induced in the coil. As the magnet moves up and down, we're going to have our electromotive force varying, which is going to produce an alternating current. State two ways of increasing the voltage induced in the coil. Firstly, we could increase the turns in the coil, or we could use a stronger magnet. Table 12.1 describes four nuclides. State which two nuclides have the same amount of protons. The amount of protons is given by the atomic number. Our atomic number is the smaller of the two. Of all the options, we see that these two are the same, which makes sense as they're both uranium. If they were a different element, then they would have to have a different amount of protons. State which two nuclides have the same number of nucleons. The amount of nucleons is given by our atomic mass, which is always the larger of the two. And as we can see, of all the options, plutonium-238 and uranium-238 are the same. 
State which one of the four nuclides has the most electrons orbiting when it is in a neutral atom. If the atom is neutral, then the amount of electrons is going to equal the amount of protons, which is given by our atomic number, the largest of which is our 94 from our plutonium-238. Thorium-234 has a half-life of 24 days. A sample of radioactive material contains 40 milligrams of thorium-234. Calculate the mass of thorium-234 remaining after 72 days. 24 fits into 72 three times, which gives us our amount of half-lives, which means our mass of 40 milligrams is going to half three times, which gives me 5 milligrams. And we're done.